Name that gland. Ovary. Oh, ovary. In your brain, think about some of the things you would be labeled. Don't call them out, but think about some of the things you would be labeling on an ovary. What's one thing you would label on an ovary? Oh, sight. Good answer. How many different follicles are there? Two. They both start with what letter? P. Awesome. Do you remember that? Because there's a P in your name. Yeah, all right. There you go. All right. What is the one that is little and tiny because it has squamous around it and its word means ancient? Primordial. Very good. Primordial. So these little ones down here are primordial follicles, and these with the cuboidal cells are primary follicles. What gland was this? Pancreas. Name any hormone that it produces. Insulin. I heard a glucagon. I'm so proud of you. Okay. <laughs> this. This wasn't our main focus, but see if you can. What is this little thing over here? A duct. Oh, that one's a duct. Oh, very good. This duct has a lumen, but I'm not going to ask you that. The whole thing is a duct with its nice little lumen. That's good. But where we really want to focus, what is this big structure here in the center? Islet of Langerhans. Yes. Is this secreting into the duct or into the blood? So it's part of which system? Endocrine. This out here secretes into the duct. So we describe this as what kind of glandular material? Exocrine. And we'll just keep in mind for later, they call it the acemi. Okay. Even though that's not going to be on this one, that's what they call it. Maybe when you get to lecture, there might be a practice quiz question that says something about um, the ACE and I making digestive enzymes, but it won't be on the lab like that. Okay. All right. Almost all, not quite all, there's other stuff that's not, but almost all of the tissues up there are which tissue type? There we go. Cuboidal epithelium. Why can we not say simple? What simple mean? One layer. And here there's not one layer. These are multi-layer clusters. Okay. All right. Oh, everybody's favorite because we do it first and we really learn it well. Name the gland. Pituitary. Okay, are you ready? My favorite question. I will point here. And I will try to be as tricky as I can. And I will say, name a hormone produced here. None. Very good. None. ADH and oxytocin come from that region as they get in the blood, but we say released. They are not produced there. Okay. Also, the other rule breaker part, what tissue type is this? Nervous tissue. So those of you that are here today that remember what neurons look like in AMP1, the reason this does not look like that is this isn't the whole neuron. It's just the axon. So if you guys will go back and watch the part one endocrine lab lecture, you will see that described really carefully. It will make sense to you. Okay. Now, cool thing. All these nice circular nuclei mean what kind of tissue is it? Cuboidal epithelium. What region is this? Anterior. Good. Anterior region of the pituitary, right? Make sure if you put anterior, you always put pituitary. Okay. How many hormones does it produce? Six. What's your favorite? Mine is ACTH. Yours is growth hormone? Or, yeah. Who's is prolactin? I'm just finding a way to say the names. LH, FSH. And any hormone that causes another hormone to be released 
is called a what hormone? Tropic. Tropic hormone. So look back to your day one pictures for that information because we did that then. Okay. All right. So now look at that. We blasted through everything except the testes. We don't need to see the testes twice. So let's go here next. I'll zoom way up like that. Have we seen any other gland? Watch, let me, let me even do a different picture. I'll run it by, you'll see what gland it is right away. So it's not going to be hard. Have we seen any other gland that has this crazy looking pink stuff that looks like a salmon fillet in the middle? Doesn't that kind of look like salmon to you? It does to me, like you slice some fish meat or something. I don't know. But anyway, that stuff we haven't seen anywhere else. So that makes this completely different. Okay. This is what a thyroid looks like. So this is a thyroid gland and a thyroid kind of like an ovary has follicles. Okay. Good news for you. There's not four different types of follicles. There's not even two. They're just all follicles. So here is a thyroid follicle and here is a thyroid follicle and there's one and there's one. And there's one, and there's one. There's that crazy one that was cut weird, so I would never ask you about it. But you get the idea? Those are, those objects are the thyroid follicles. So what gland is this? Yeah, the thyroid gland. So I, I know there's not much on there. I'm going to add one more thing and have you take a picture. Maybe two more things. This substance in here. We call it colloid. That pink stuff is called colloid. Colloid just means a suspension, but they actually use it to name that stuff. Okay. What it is, though, is it's the stored I know I could have put my H, but I just wanted to write it. What colloid is, is it's stored thyroid hormone. Okay. So there's your first picture. I know there's not much there, but that's okay. Cause that's helping you understand when we zoom up and see these others, that there's going to be a lot of follicles, but to really see a follicle, we have to zoom up on it. Something to consider when we go through these, it's not a bad idea to get out your hand out and find the thyroid bottom of page one and just to see what kind of things you might need to know about it that are on there. Mm-hmm. There you go. Oh, check this out. You know, like we did the testes and the ovaries, we have a version of that picture that's just far away that you can't see hardly anything. That's the thyroid's version. All you would need to know there are those little things or follicles. You could probably identify the colloid. I could get there and say, what's that pink stuff? And this is a thyroid gland. Um, then I could ask you about hormones, but I know I won't on that because I have better pictures for that. Okay. If you want that picture, I'm not going to mark it up, but if you want it, just because it might show up on the test, you're welcome to take a picture of it. If you think you would recognize it, you don't have to. There you go. Thanks for asking before I started writing again, because then it gets complicated. Um, I want to go next. back to that where I was starting with you guys. Okay. Now what I expect that even on this power, even though we haven't done this in depth, 
I think that everybody can tell what is this pink stuff. That's the colloid. And this is how we describe it. It is the stored what? So now is where I get to tell you that the thyroid hormones, there's two of them, and they each have their own name. On your handout, you can look there, and you can see that I have abbreviated for you. They're called T3 and T4, the two thyroid hormones. Now, T3 has three of something, and T4 has four of it. That's why they're called T3 and T4. And what they have is iodine. The reason that they put iodine in salt, oh, we said it in our class the other we actually talked about it, is because the soil doesn't have enough iodine, and they put it in salt, and iodine is needed to make your thyroid hormones. Okay. I do want you to go into that handout though, real quick. And on your handout, see if you can pronounce the name of T3, what T3 stands for. Good. Try iodothyronine, okay? Here's why I tell you this. There's a question on the lecture test that says, what's the medical name for T3? And there's a, or sorry, on the lab test. There's a question on the lab test that says, what's the medical name for T4? On the lab test, if you get that question, you're only going to know this if you were here or if you choose to listen to the lecture later if you're not here. But here's the answer you can put. You can put T3 and you can put T4. Because if you get a blood test done on the blood test nowadays, it says T3 and T4. So those are very acceptable terms for the thyroid hormones. I will tell you this. On the lecture test... And this way you don't have to spell it. I want you to know T3 is triiodothyronine. There are going to be questions that in the lecture test, the multiple choice that I might write out, triiodothyronine is also known as what? T3, T4, T2, T100, something crazy like that. Okay. I want you to be able to pick it out, but I don't feel as, as tied to it to make you know how to spell it. Okay. So try iodothyronine which is t3 and the t4 version is commonly called thyroxine those words may appear on your lecture test okay if you get those questions on the lab test like i said if it says what's the acceptable scientific name for t3 you just give me t3 and you're good to go okay if you leave it blank you still miss it I need to know that you understand that T3 is acceptable, okay? And there's, unfortunately, because the way Blackboard is, I can't edit my pools, and I can't just kill those questions because they're in a bigger, larger pool that I can't change right now. Otherwise, I'd just wipe them out, and I can't. All right. Can you, from where you're sitting, can you see that these nuclei are nice and what? Round circles. What does that mean to us tissue-wise? It means that that's cuboidal epithelium. Also where you're sitting. Can you tell that that is one nice layer? And this is one nice layer. So what do we call the tissue type of cuboidal epithelium when it's only one layer? Simple. Epithelium. If I want that answer, I have to point at that. And what does my question need to be? Name this tissue, right? I have to ask you the tissue name. Because, can you guys tell me, what is this whole thing called? Good, I heard it over there. And now I heard it over here. That whole thing is a thyroid follicle. But that tissue that surrounds it, that single layer of cells that surround it, 
that simple cuboidal epithelium. You know, I, I need it to be even funner. They give these cells a name, but thankfully it's such an easy name. I'm going to erase that because I want us to see. So I'll just remind me, what is this whole thing? A follicle. So watch this. I love it. Finally, they did something nice. Those are called follicle cells. That's their official name, follicle cells. So the cells of the thyroid follicle that are simple cuboidal epithelial cells, their name is follicle cells. Okay. What do those follicle cells make? T3 and T4. I'll give you another way to say that. You are welcome on the test to call T3 and T4 the thyroid hormones. If you are asked to name the hormones produced by the follicle cells, you can say T3 and T4 or the thyroid hormones, right? There may be, um, there may be a wording on a question that says, what is the group name for the hormones produced by the thyroid. It's thyroid hormones. That's the group name. They're actually called the thyroid hormones. It's not me trying to be tricky. It's me trying to help you understand that it's really that simple for the thyroid, that this thing is a thyroid. It has follicles. The cells of the follicles are called follicle cells, and they make the thyroid hormones, which are commonly called thyroid hormones. The two specific ones are T3 and T4, okay? It gets complicated, but it's not meant to be. Here's the most interesting part of this. These are not those. These are different. These cells are clearly outside of a follicle. So look what they call it. follicular cells. There's not a lot of them. There's a few. I might have missed one here or there. But they're little groups of cells that are not in the follicle. They're not part of a follicle. Look, by their nucleus, you know that's not one. By their nucleus, you can tell they're cuboidal. So they're going to make a hormone. Can anybody look on the handout and tell me what it says the parafollicular cells produce? Very good. They make a different hormone. It is called calcitonin, which regulates calcium. But remember, regulate is not a word that we want to use. I will teach you about that in a little bit. Okay? Maybe actually next time we come to class. We'll see. It's doing pretty good. So here is a pretty good markup of the thyroid. Go ahead and get this one. I'm going to show you another picture. We're going to mark it up again. The thyroid, one of the reasons I saved the thyroid and the adrenal, they're a little bit complex. I know we get tired toward the end of class, but we needed to do a lot today. I didn't want to tire you out right at the beginning, so I did the easy ones. And now I know you're going to be tired anyway, so I might as well just do the hard stuff. Okay. This thyroid's really not hard. It's just, it's just so much. We just have so many things that we keep doing and keep talking about. Make sure I get it. Bless you. How do you know it's a thyroid? Colloid. There you go. Colloid. Yeah. Tell me, what kind of tissue is this? Simple cuboidal, right? One layer of cube shape. Now, I know. I'm going to tell you guys I know this. That doesn't look like cubes when it's zoomed down. That's why I'm teaching it to you so you know, no matter what power you see it on, this is a gland 
the cells that make the hormones are cuboidal shaped. So these are cuboidal. I used that one picture to zoom up and show you. So your brain would go, oh, they really are. But when you see them on most power and on the test, they're not going to look cuboidal. You just have to remember they are, OK? Because as a gland, it's cuboidal cells that secrete most of the time. Okay. Hey, because this is a gland that makes hormones, where do those hormones get released into? Into the blood, into the capillaries, into the blood, right. And then where does your blood travel? It travels almost everywhere. So we just say everywhere, right? It travels everywhere. And so remember, the hormones we're doing now, there has to be capillaries in there that we're not even seeing. So that the hormone gets in the blood and then it goes everywhere. Because that's what they do. That's what they do. Okay, if we're going to mark this one up, let's always start with the same. What am I going to call this? Colloid. What is it? Do you guys remember? Good. By the way, the thyroid, you may have noticed, I never said stored hormone before the thyroid. This is the only one, the only gland that stores a significant amount of its hormone. Okay, the only one. So your thyroid gland right now that's in your neck here, it's storing about two to three weeks worth of the hormone. So what that means, if your thyroid quit functioning right now, you'd still be normal for two to three weeks. And then all of a sudden you'd notice a dramatic change in energy and other things going on because then there's no more colloid to convert. Okay. What are the name of these cells? Yes, follicle cells. What is the name of this whole thing yeah and i'll just tell y'all uh, there'll be more than one question i'll know that you know it's a thyroid you don't have to put the word thyroid on the follicle uh, you can you can call it a thyroid follicle it's totally acceptable just to call it a follicle and on this picture this is why i like coming to this there's not much interstitial space where that we could see those other cells. So I would never ask it on this one. I would never ask the parafollicular cells and calcitonin on this picture. We have to have a big, a good space. So let me go show you. Uh, let me put this here real quick because I want you to get one more picture. So go ahead and get that and then we'll go do one more. See, we have a lot of good thyroid pictures, so I don't know which one you're going to get on the test because there's so many good ones. It's not like some of those glands where we only have one or two good pictures and the rest are garbage. Look at that one. Now, I know when you get to this one, these follicle cells aren't beautiful. It doesn't look like a perfect row, but you can still see them. You'll always go to this. What is this substance? There it is. But look what I want you to see here. That's not a part of this follicle. It's not a part of this follicle. And this thing is just all messed up. What are those? And what do they produce? They produce the hormone called calcitonin. Okay. A different hormone that tones down calcium is how I'll say it later, okay? But you will get there. So the interesting thing, the thyroid, 
It regulates your metabolism like, like everybody talks about, but it also regulates your calcium. It plays a minor role in regulating it, but it does regulate it as well. So two different areas, really two groups of cells. The follicle cells of the follicle, that's all about your metabolism, your T3 and your T4. And the parafollicular cells, the little cells outside of that, that play a little role in regulating the calcium. And so that's your last thyroid picture, okay? That's it for the thyroid for now. Look, that, that shows you what it is. I just wanted to show you. Um, you won't see this one on the test. But look here. Now you can tell that the acini are cuboidal cells. This picture is good for showing that. Because you can see the nice round nuclei. So the acini are actually cuboidal. Right? This islet is so tiny compared to ours. But because of the way it's shown, you can see that these are cuboidal cells too. It's just the cells don't show up as well here. The cells out here have a lot of color, and these cells don't. They stain different, so it makes the eyelet stand apart. It doesn't stain the same, so it looks different. Once again, this is just another pancreas just to help you remember. Eyelets are little separate structures. But that's the picture I love right there. That's a better one. <clears throat> Where's your pancreas? Ah, good. So it's in your abdominal area. Notice I did not say cavity. I'm being very particular right now because it's not in your abdomen. It's behind it, but it's in your abdominal area, kind of between the kidneys there. Okay. Let's go back to that picture where we saw that. Yeah, right in there. Okay. What hormones does it make? Insulin and glucagon. Yeah. Which one lowers blood sugar? Insulin. Insulin. Very good. What's the other? <laughs> glucagon. There you go. How many? Oh, if I zoom up like that, you can almost see that, but I'm not going to do that. Let's go back. By seeing this nice and neat and so big, it gives us the idea that a pancreas doesn't have a lot of those. I'm going to tell you how many it has just to kind of shock you. This is not a test answer. I don't want you to spend time brain power memorizing this. The average person's pancreas has 300,000 of these. That is zoomed up a lot. We have 300,000 islets of Langerhans, each of those are making insulin and glucagon and other hormones we haven't even talked about, okay? So we see a picture and it's got one in the center and sometimes students' brains go, oh, pancreas has an islet, one islet. Oh, it has hundreds of thousands of islets. They're so tiny, we had to zoom this up almost 400 times just to get a picture of it, okay? All right. We're finally ready for the hardest one. The hardest one is one of the first glands we talked about. It's this one. And I'm going to show you by doing this for you. I'm going to take you back in your memory and remind you that on day one, we drew a little gland that had that shape. Right? And in here, that's the medulla. That's the adrenal medulla. What is all the rest of that called? The adrenal cortex. So before I mark this up, here's what I would like you to do. Top of page two. I want you to see already how many parts 
do I need to show you of the cortex? Three. Do you guys see that? Zone. Oh. That's okay. No, I have, I have so many. I have so many. Just hit me. Zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticularis. Oh, I'm sorry. They have terrible names, but those are their names. I didn't create them. There are three zones, or I could say three regions of the adrenal cortex. The zona glomerulosa, the zona FASCIC, oops, ULATA, fasciculata, but it's spelled fasciculata, okay, and the zona R E T I C U L A R I S reticularis. Let me show you where those go, okay? That outer portion all the way around on the inside, though. Zona glomerulosa. Z G. So that would go all the way around, and it would be Z G right there, okay? Inside of that, and this part, I always do this. These are going to be the longest regions. It's going to be the zona fasciculata, the ZF. And right up by the medulla is a little bitty reticularis, the ZR. I will never show you the bottom part where they're out of order, where they're upside down. I will always show you a picture orienting it that way from top to bottom. We have AMP in eight weeks. We learned the endocrine system in a week and a half. We don't have time to be flipping pictures and turning them crazy ways, okay? You don't have enough time with the material to do that. So you will always, this is my promise to you, if you see this gland on the test, it will be upright, and I'm gonna give you a big hint. Your kidneys have fat packed around them, protecting them. Okay, you can get super skinny and your kidneys still have fat. Okay, unless you're starving to death, it starts to take it all away. And if you lose a lot of weight, your kidneys have fat around them, it's protected. Where's your adrenal gland? On top of your kidneys, they have fat around them. So I will always show you. on the outside of the gland. I'll always show you a picture that shows you some fat cells, okay? So you can go, oh, there's fat. That's around the adrenal and the kidney. Now I know what I'm looking at. Also, this line here, there is a portion of the gland that is made of connective tissue and it's called a capsule and it's right around the outside of it so before we even see the picture and i will go back to the picture i want you to know when i show you the adrenal gland you're not just going to see the gland you're going to see the fat and the capsule the connective tissue and then you'll see the cuboidal cells okay and I will give you a way to easily tell where it's glomerulosa or where it's the longer fasciculata. Why did I just say that? Here's why I said only that. Because when I show you this on the test, oh, I didn't. I do want that. We will only go that far into the glands. There's just so much here and it's hard to get a great picture. Oh, I guess I do need to make that a little thicker. So here's what this means. You'll see fat, you'll see a capsule, you'll see glomerulosa, 
and you'll see fasciculata. And then this won't be in your picture. I won't show you that because there's too much under that. Okay. Go ahead and get a picture of this. I know I'm going fast. You'll have this in your notes. After we do the gland, this will make more sense. But I wanted to do a little orienting before I showed you the real gland. And by the way, I, I have one really nice picture of the gland that I like to use. There's hundreds of pictures on the internet of it, but I really like this one. Right here. Who wants to tell me what this is? That is your adipose tissue. So I'm just going to write it up there in blue. Oh, I got it. There. Now it'll let me do that. So that's the adipose. Right here. Above that line. What do you think? That is the capsule. And the capsule is connective tissue. That's what CT stands for, connective tissue. You might remember in a &P one you weren't allowed just to say connective tissue. You had to say dense regular connective tissue or dense irregular connective tissue. In a &P two, you can just say connective tissue, OK? It's just generalized connective tissue. I'm fine with that. Below that, here, see our nice round nuclei? What does that mean? Cuboidal. These are all cuboidal cells. So how do we know where it's glomerulosa, the top layer, the ZG, or fasciculata? It's really simple. Here's how you know. Look over here on the side. See how this comes up as a group right there? And this one sticks up as a group, and that's all together. So these, I like to show you over here and look like this. Those finger-like structures that are pushing up from the bottom, they're long. In AMP, you had long connective tissue around your muscles. It was called a fascicle. So these things are long. So somebody said they're like a fascicle. So they called this area from about there down, the zona fasciculata. So how's that different? Look, they're just little clusters. They don't have any definite shape to all of them, but they're little clusters, especially, I love this one here and over here. They're little circles. Now I know what you're saying. You're going, wait, these things are coming up awful high over, maybe even into there. Yeah, there's some blend. Sometimes the fasciculata goes into the glomerulosa. But the way I'm going to do it with you is about from there down. That's fasciculata. And up here, just under the capsule, that's the zona glomerulosa. I have a way to tell you what that means. But it's not anything we've heard of, so it doesn't matter. So what I'll tell you is when we get to the urinary system, there's part of the kidney called the glomerulus. We'll talk about it then. But for right now, there's no reason for you to know that. This group of cells makes one hormone. And the group of cells below it here makes a completely different hormone. So what we're doing now is we're taking information off the page and putting it on a picture so that we have another way to recall it. Go ahead and look for me. On your sheet, it should say the gl zona glomerulosa makes a hormone called aldosterone. Aldosterone.
and the zona fasciculata makes your number one stress hormone. Cortisol. You might remember we talked about another hormone that regulates cortisol that causes cortisol to be released. We'll talk about that later. Cortisol is number one stress hormone. So cortisol is released from these cells. Aldosterone, which does something else, is released from the cells up above it. If we had a better picture, you would see a zona reticularis down there. And if the picture was better, way below that, you would see the medulla. You will not see that on any of our pictures. Okay. You should still be familiar with each layer from the handout and know what hormones it produces, okay? The zona reticularis makes a group of hormones that are called androgens that are called androgens. It's a whole bunch of hormones. And androgens are hormones that determine kind of how much muscle mass you have, where your hair is on your body, where you store body fat. So some of those differences commonly seen between males and females. It's not just estrogen and testosterone and progesterone, but your adrenal gland specifically this part of the cortex called the zona reticularis makes some hormones that help contribute to your hormonal makeup or the hormonal part of how you're kind of put together and what you do. This is a lot. Now you can see why I drew that first picture. I would highly recommend that before lab test day, you practice drawing your picture of your adrenal cortex and label it adipose, capsule, zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticularis. Go over to the other side and write the names of the hormones. Because one kind of question that's real easy, remember we don't always have pictures. I could easily have a question that says, what hormone is produced from the zona fasciculata? Cortisol. A different question. What hormone is produced by the zona glomerulosa? Aldosterone. What hormone is produced by the zona reticularis? The androgens. Go ahead and look on your handout for this next one. The adrenal medulla makes which hormones? Oh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. You ever hear of those before? Epi is like an EpiPen, right? It's also called adrenaline. And norepinephrine, you probably talked about in AMP1 because it was one of the first neurotransmitters that they discovered a lot of. It wasn't the first, but it was one of the early ones. Um, norepinephrine plays a role in fight or flight. So it's something that you may have heard of before. This all of this, once again, is, and this is a lot, this is a lot, and just so you know, I can feel your energy right now, and pretty much every class is tired when they get this, and this is a lot, okay? This gland is a lot to know. Good news, we don't have our lab test until starting this weekend. A lot of days to learn this before you're going to see this on the test. If you wait to study it, though, this is one of those things that if you look at this adrenal gland three times a day, every day between now and Friday, this is going to feel easy. If you don't look at it again until you're cramming the night before you want to take the test, this is going to feel impossible. Because 
And who's ever heard of a word glomerulosa? Fasciculata, reticularis. Maybe some people that really had a ton of science classes before, but most people, no, that seems like fake words that they just made up, but they're really not. Okay, everybody got their picture of this? Okay, go ahead and get your picture because now we can, you know, sometimes stuff actually hides stuff. So let me unmark it up and zoom up and let you see that they're all cuboidal cells. That's cuboidal epithelium, just like we've been seeing. But there is a difference to how they're arranged. So first off, I'm going to go up here and show you. Oh, yeah, that's fat. I don't know if you remember this from AMP1, but what happens in a fat cell? Just in case. There's a membrane around there, and fat fills up the cell, and it pushes the nuclei off to the side. So all you see, it looks like a marshmallow with a nucleus way out here. The nucleus is still in the cell, but it's right up against the cell membrane, okay? So it's full of fat. So this one too, full of fat, just has something else sticking on it there. And that one too, so that's it. This is the capsule, it's real thin, but look, as soon as you start to see these nice cuboidal cells, this is the part of the gland that makes the hormone. So as we scroll down, that that you're seeing at the bottom there, look how they cluster. There's little clusters here. That, sorry. See if I can get back to that. That's the zona glomerulosa all there. And if we go further down and go over here, as we get down here, you start to see the fasciculata. They make a nice column. So the reason I like this picture so well is on the side, on the left side, if we zoom it back, and even through the center, you can see that it's tall through here, but especially over here. So you always, and this is a tip for taking a test and seeing a picture. A pointer comes in and it's pointing here. Don't just look at the pointer, look everywhere. Because if the pointer comes in and points here, that looks like fasciculata. That's cool, that's a good clue. But if it points in here, that just looks crazy if you're only looking right there. I mean, maybe you could go, that's cuboidal cells, but I don't know what it is. You have to look up there and see the fat in the capsule and down here and see fasciculata before you know what it is. And then by process of elimination, oh, the part that's in between the dead zone there, that's glomerulosa, and that makes a very important hormone called aldosterone. Yes, ma'am. For the ovary and the thyroid, yes. Where we did it and we labeled it simple to get full credit, if you're asked what tissue is that, to get full credit, it has to say simple cuboidal epithelium. If you just put cuboidal, you would probably get three out of the four points. Okay? But those are really. Was there another example? I, I don't process it like that, so I'm trying to remember. Was there another one? Mm. Pituitary, no. Pancreas, no, nothing simple in those. And then we had adrenal, nothing simple here. And then we have the ovary, the testes, there was nothing simple there. So yeah, it's only the thyroid and the ovary that has simple. Okay. Good. Let's see if I can find this. So here's an old, awful picture of the adrenal gland. That, oh, the only reason I would put it on a test is to have you say adrenal and fat, because you can see the fat, and that's the capsule. But in here, and now I want you to see these zones they're not clearly marked. I mean, I look up here and I see fasciculata here going all the way to the top. 
and it looks like fasciculite over here. It doesn't look even and throughout. So that's why I picked the slide that I picked that's so good that you can see. But this also helps you understand why even our good slide, it looks like fasciculata is not consistent. It looks like it's higher in some places than it is in others because that's how the glands made. Look at that. This was good for just adipose in the capsule, but for nothing else. So that's why I put other slides there to help you. But remember, I'm going to I'm going to test you over good pictures, over things that you spent time learning. OK, I'm not going to throw terrible things at you on test day. That's not what about this. This is all about. All right. Those are all of the slide pictures now for all of the main glands. Now, that's not every gland. We didn't do the thymus. We don't have a slide for the thymus. We don't have a slide for the parathyroids. Okay? We don't have a slide for the kidney. This isn't about overwhelming you with slides. We picked some of the very important ones that had very obvious characteristics and we wanted you to learn those characteristics to learn more about the system okay teaching it kind of those two things together so let's go here now back to this and let's look at so just put this up there just to remind you that you have information on this handout that is very beneficial to you. And let me let me zoom down on to right there. Take it down to there. Uh, can I get it? That's right at the top. Yeah, that's good right there. So there's everything adrenal. Notice on that handout, it does not say fat and it does not say capsule. Right? The handouts hormones that are produced and what they do. The handout's not perfectly about the slides. So keep that in mind. That is why I have people take pictures of the slides. So you have all the slide information there because the slide information is not all up there. Some of it is, but not all of it. Okay. Reminder, and you know, some of you, it's your first class. So maybe you don't, didn't get this at, look at how this is organized. Here is the name of the gland. And when we have two different areas like this, these are the different regions, okay? On the adrenal gland, remember on the slide, we never saw this, right? We never saw the medulla slide. So sometimes I tell people, not always, but not on the slide hurts to have it clear as day so you know so you'll never get confused that's not on the slide only those two zones are going to be on the slide all right so those two zones will be on the slide that's not on the slide that one's not on the slide either but you still need to be familiar with the information what did i have you guys write on your paper right there by target i think it's on the front page or did i have you write it yet maybe i didn't tell your class to write it tell me the target is where what are located very good so this is where your receptors are so remember the first day we made such a big deal out of all hormones travel through the Blood, and where's your blood go? Everywhere. Everywhere. So these hormones do not go just to the target. They go everywhere. The target is where the receptors are. So even though we haven't talked about it yet, aldosterone travels through the blood and goes everywhere. Its receptors are only in the kidney. Okay? And sometimes... Obviously, that's not a target. That's just telling you something about it. And that's not a target. It's just telling you something about it because it's not a specific tissue. 
look at what we've said the target is for the medulla hormones, epi and norepinephrine. What's that mean? Heart and blood vessels. Okay, cardiovascular system means heart and blood vessels. Please note, epinephrine and norepinephrine do a lot more than that. They do other things, especially as neurotransmitters. This is just our focus right now. So we want your focus to be on that. So we put that. Um, there's no kind of question that's going to separate out the focus from what it really is, though. So how do you study this handout before I let you go? Because we're going to cover most of this on the handout. We'll do it at the beginning of class next time. I'll go through your opposite hormones, talk about them. We'll do some big hormones and help lock those in. Come test day, a lot of endocrine questions will come straight from pictures. But... There's a lot of material on here that has nothing to do with the picture. So you can have questions, and I've said this before, you can have questions from the material. How do you figure out what most of the questions will be? You know, you're never going to know what all the potential questions, can, anything that was said is a potential question. But how do you start narrowing it down? This is how. On the test for endocrine, a majority of our questions are going to come from this column over here. Most of the questions, you're going to have a picture of a gland, and it's going to ask you to name the gland, name the region, name the hormone produced, or something about that gland that we did on the picture. Okay? On the lab test, which is what we're studying for right now, very few questions are going to come from this column. I'm not telling you it's unimportant. This is important information, but probably you might only get two or three questions on the whole test that ask you to identify a target of a hormone or a gland, okay? Most of the questions are with the main information. What gland makes what hormones, or those hormones come from what region, and the stuff about the pictures. Very few questions from here. A few more questions from over here than here, okay? Maybe one or two questions here. Maybe five questions specifically. What's the function of this hormone? What's the function of this hormone? So let me give you an example. Without a picture, I could just say, what's the function of insulin? And you would say? Lowers blood sugar reduces blood sugar, decreases blood sugar, makes my blood sugar go down. There's not, I'm, I'm trying to get you away from memorizing. You don't have to say it the perfect way, okay? Unless it's an A and P word that we need and then it has to be perfect. But when you're just telling me how something works, you use a right phrase and that's okay. It doesn't have to be my words. It can be what's correct, okay? So, I know we haven't talked about these and there's a lot of functions over here. Here's how I do the lab test. If I asked you to give me a function of cortisol, you could give me one function. I'm never on lab gonna say, list the four functions. I won't do that. I will say, tell me a function of cortisol, okay? Tell me a function of aldosterone. There's a few of them. You pick one time at the beginning of class, it will be about me going through the most important ones. So right now, because of we missed the first day, we went so fast the past two days, your mind's probably a blur. You're just hoping you can identify the right gland right now, what hormone comes from it. That's okay. Study over the next two days, and when we come to class before we do blood on Wednesday, I will talk about aldosterone and its opposite, because it has an opposite. I will do calcitonin and parathyroid, which are opposites. We already did insulin and glucagon. That's knocking out a main area. We can go back to the pituitary gland and look at growth hormone and prolactin and ACTH. You guys already know what those do. Hopefully, we'll see how good handle on those. 
but there's a few others at the end. Hey, if y'all want a picture of that, just snag it so you have receptors and not on slide. You don't have to get it, but if you want it there, I don't feel the need to turn the lights off because that's not a detailed picture. That just might remind you something that maybe you want to mark up your picture that way. And I'm going to take the picture so I tell the next class about that. Watch this. If we go to the bottom, we did pineal on day one, right? We did the thymus and we did the kidney, but we haven't done the heart or the placenta yet. So we have some little ones at the end that we need to clean up and I'll clean those up with you next time. Okay. So you have two days, look at those pictures at least three times a day, start getting that stuff in. Now's the time. If you haven't already done it, you need to start taking your lecture practice quizzes and you need to start watching your lecture videos because the next week will go by fast. This week, I promise you, this week's going to go by so fast. You're going to blink and it's going to be the day you're taking the test. And you know, what happened to the week? So you've got to do something. You've got to work on the class every day, whether you're in class or not. That's the only way to stay on top of it. Okay.